Hello Year 11, this is the Triple Science Physics Paper 1 Masterclass video recording. Make sure you are in the correct room or you're watching the correct video, otherwise you might miss some bits and pieces that are specific for you. Now, the only thing you'll need for this is a piece of paper or a whiteboard and something to write on. Okay, now we're going to split this into two different types of slides. We're going to look at slides which are read like this, which where you're listening, you're quiet, you're reading, and some of the time, a lot of the time, you're going to be finding mistakes. Okay, other types of slide are green, and that's when you're reflecting, you're writing, and you're fixing those mistakes. Okay, so jumping, jumping in straight away, the most important thing, I think, for you is the equation sheet. You're the last year that's going to get the equation sheet, so take advantage of it. Okay, choose the right equation. Okay, um, whenever it has a calculation question, have your equation sheet ready. Okay, as soon as it says, write down the, have your equation sheet ready. Okay, what is the equation that links these, these, and these together? Have the equation sheet ready. Because the next years are not going to have those equation sheets like you. They'll only have a few equations. Okay, now I like to use a highlighter. You can also underline, you can circle the different bits and pieces. Um, but make sure you use that right equation. Okay, so your first job, I've given you three little questions where you need to choose the right equation from the equation sheet. Okay, you're given energy transfer to time and power. Um, sorry, given energy transferred in time, you need to calculate the power. You're given potential difference and resistance, you need to calculate current. You're given current and time to calculate charge flow. Okay, so the equations are on this side of the equation sheet. Remember, the equation sheet is double sided, but these ones are on this side. Pause the video here, jot down the equations that you would use. Okay. Okay, moving on. So hopefully you chose power is energy trans power equals energy transferred divided by time, potential difference equals current times by resistance, and charge flow equals current times by time. Now, all you're doing is matching up the quantities you're given in the question with the quantities on the equation sheet. That's all you're doing. It's not difficult. Okay. Now, don't be tempted to shorten them. Don't be tempted to change the symbols. You can write the symbols down instead of the words but make sure you copy them exactly from the equation sheet. Because for instance, if you were to write a capital C for charge flow, that will not get you a mark. You need to use AQA symbols and AQA's words, okay? So make sure you're copying it, copying it accurately from the equation sheet, okay? Um, and like I say, take advantage of, advantage of it. You're the last year that's gonna get these equations. Right, moving on. Next question, next thing we're doing, is a question on energy. Okay, we've got a diagram showing a hot tub and, our, and um, full of water, and it's got this little wood burning stove thing that's getting water into the hot tub and heating it up. Okay, and you need to tick one box, and you need to tick the type of fuel that's used. You need to give two environmental effects of using wood, and the answer here that's written is fuel is eco-friendly and it gives out pollution. And you need to describe the change, uh, you need to describe Describe the change to the stores of energy of the wood, pipe and water as the water is heated. A little bit of a confusing sentence there, so be careful of it. And then, this is the answer. We're given the chemical energy was transferred to heat, uh, the pipe had lots of heat energy, and the water had lots of heat energy. Okay, so what I want you to do, I want you to find where they haven't got marks, and I want you to fix where they haven't got marks. So fix any mistakes you see. Okay, pause the video now. Okay, moving on. So this one is quite a tricky question, especially part C. Okay, now the first part, A, it's not a non-renewable biofuel. Okay, burning wood so you can plant trees and grow them very quickly, which makes it a renewable biofuel. Bio because it used to be alive. Okay, very recently. Um, in terms of giving two environmental effects of using wood, fuel is eco-friendly. That's true, sure, but that's not specific enough to get a mark. You need to say why it's friendly for the environment. Okay, it gives that pollution. That's true. What type of pollution you need to say? And the last part here, well, especially the first one, the chemical energy was transferred to heat. That's true. You're not actually answering the question. You need to describe the change. Okay, so when we go about fixing it, we should tick the renewable biofuel. We should say things like it causes deforestation. It gives out air pollution. It gives out carbon dioxide. Okay, and then for this last question, Whenever you see the word change, be ready to talk about increasing or decreasing or staying the same. Okay, you need to be ready to use that kind of language if you want to get the marks. So here, the wood, the chemical store decreases. The amount of energy stored in the chemical section in the wood goes down. 
Okay, so you need to say chemical store decreases. In the pipe, the pipe gets hotter, the thermal store increases. Water, the thermal store increases. So when you see the word change, and it will come up in your paper, almost certainly, there'll be a question asking you to describe or describe and explain the changes in this. You will need to say something is getting bigger or something is increasing, something is decreasing. Okay, use that language and that will allow you to get all the marks for that question. Okay? Right, next question. We've got a calculation question. Now, the calculation, the equation is the correct equation. Okay, all of these calculation questions, the equation I've chosen, have been correct. But there is a mistake somewhere else. Okay, so we've got air inside a balloon that's got this mass, 0 0.00320 kilograms. The temperature of the air in the balloon decreased by 215 degrees. The change in thermal energy of the air in the balloon was 860 joules. And we need to use those to calculate the specific heat capacity of the air in the balloon. Okay, so you need to try and find where the, where the student went wrong, see if they get any marks, and see how you would go about getting all the marks. Okay, so pause the video now. Okay, now this shows why it's important that you should try and substitute first. Okay, because if you rearrange first and you do, a, and you do it wrong, you make a mistake, you get no marks. So it's always wise to substitute first. Okay, so this student... Because they rearranged it wrong in this first step, they get no benefit of the doubt, they get zero, they get no marks. Even though they knew what they're supposed to be doing, they might know, um, they might be really good at maths, they might uh, have used the right equation, all of this stuff is true, they've put the, into the calculator right, they've substituted in what they think it should be, they don't get the benefit of the doubt, okay? They get no marks. So, I think it's much better to substitute first. You write down the equation, we substitute the, the numbers into the right symbols, then we rearrange. And if ever, you're, um, if ever you're not sure about the substitution, sometimes it's helpful to just draw a little line. So for instance, we can have the mass goes to the M. The change in temperature goes to my change in temperature. My energy goes to my energy. Okay, that just helps me put the numbers in the right spots. Okay, you don't have to do that, but I think that can be a useful, useful technique. Okay, so we write the equation, we substitute, then we rearrange. Okay. Something else that you should be very aware of is prefixes and units. Now, in this question, we don't have to do any changing of prefixes and units, but there will be questions on your paper where you have to change those prefixes. Be ready for them to come up over the next few calculation questions. Okay? Right, moving on. Next, we've got a... Um, let's just stop the drawing. Finish drawing. Next, we've got a new calculation. Uh, toast was moved upward by a spring. So we've got this toaster and it's popped up after it's finished toasting. And the change in gravitation potential energy of the toast is 0 0.049 joules. Okay, 0.049 joules. The mass of the toast was 0 0.050 kilograms. And we've got the gravitational field strength is 9.8. We need to calculate the change in the height of the toast. Okay, we write down the equation and then they put into numbers and we've got this number. Okay, so pause the video here, try and spot the mistake, try and fix it. Okay, moving on. So, this student, okay, they didn't substitute properly. They didn't put the numbers in the right spot. Okay, so they really could do with this technique where we draw a line to the right spots. Okay, because their energy, the 0.049, they put into the height. That's wrong. That should go towards the energy. Okay, so be really careful about where you're substituting the numbers in. Okay, so... Um, correct answer isn't 0 0.02, it's 0 0.1. So we substitute in, we then rearrange, and we get a height of 10 centimetres. Okay, 0 0.1 metres. Now when you're putting this number into your calculator, be very careful of how you're entering it. Make sure you use the brackets, or make sure you use, um, some calculators have a, have a fraction button that you can do a good division with. But make sure you're aware of your bid mass or your bod mass. Okay, don't do 0 0.049 divided by 0 0.05 and then all of that times by 9.8 just because you push your numbers into the calculator wrong. Okay, and to check you haven't done that wrong, look at the answer. Does the answer make sense? Is 10 centimetres up out of the toaster a good height? And I think it is because like, it pops a little bit out of the toaster. Okay, that's a sensible. If it was 10 metres, that's not sensible. Okay, so do a little sanity check at the end of your calculation just to make sure that the answer makes sense. If it's way too heavy, if it's an apple that weighs 10,000 newtons, that's too heavy for an apple. Okay, make sure that the answer makes sense. 
Right, next thing. I would like to go through some of the required practicals. Now, the required practicals will come up in some form on the paper. We don't know which ones. Okay, we don't know which ones, but one of them will come up. You'll be asked about a method for one. You'll be asked to, to do some, to some, show your scientific skills. Okay, they will come up in some form. Okay, so first we'll go through the density required practical. Um, so there's a diagram on how you can use a displacement can to find volume. There's a method with a couple of missing sentences. Um, there's a box showing a rearranging triangle. Some people love the rearranging triangles. Um, where I'd like you to try and write the units that we might use for density, mass and volume. And then there's a little question about calculating density of a 52 gram rock that's displacing 30 centimetres cubed of water. Okay. And I want you to do it in kilograms per metres cubed. Now be very careful about converting 30 centimetres cubed into metres cubed. There might be 100 centimetres in a metre, but there is not 100 centimetres cubed in one metres cubed. Okay, be very careful about that, um, that conversion. Okay, so pause the video here and, and, and see what you can do. Okay, moving on. So here we've got a displacement can. Okay, it's filled to the brim with water. We put in our regular shaped object and it displaces some water. The volume, the, the level of the water would rise and it will go out the spout and we collect it and measure the displaced volume with a measuring cylinder and that will give us the volume of our irregular shaped object. Okay, or we could put it directly into a measuring cylinder full of water or some other fluid and we can see the change in that volume. Okay, and that change in volume, the displaced volume, will be equal to the volume of the shape. Okay, the other measurement we have to do is we use a mass balance to measure the mass. Okay, and then we can use our formula density is mass divided by volume. We've got the mass, we know the volume because it's the same as the displaced volume, we can find the density. Okay, now here um, we've got the calculation to find the density in kilograms per meters cubed. And notice I'm doing 30 divided by 100 cubed just because of the fact that it's centimeters. Okay, so. If we cube the fact that we know that there's 100 centimetres in a metre, that can convert our centimetres into metres cubed. Okay, so just be just be wary of that. Okay, I don't think that's going to come up, but it could. Right, next required practical is about energy loss and temperature and heating. Okay, so we've got a little beaker that we put in some hot water in this case, and we'll coat the um, outer larger beaker in some insulation of this type we're doing different materials now you could do this experiment where we're changing the thickness of the material or the number of layers but in this case we're looking at different materials and we're looking at their thermal conductivity how good they are at conducting heat um, we've got a thermometer to measure the temperature change and we've got a stopwatch to measure the time as the as the experiment goes on okay now what i'd like you to do is write down which material had the lowest thermal conductivity and how can we tell using the graph here and the results and how could you improve the experiment? What are the variables in the experiment? What will you do to change the results? Uh, uh, what well, sorry, how would the results change if you use cold water instead of hot in the beaker? And how would you stay safe in the experiment? What are any of the, the hazards and the risks involved in this experiment? How would you control them? Okay, so pause the video here and see what you can do. Okay, moving on. So the material with the lowest thermal conductivity is material one. And we know that because the rate of energy transfer was the lowest. We know it's the lowest because the gradient's the lowest. It took the longest for it to drop down to 60 degrees. Okay, the others dropped down past 60 degrees much quicker. So they were not as effective at conducting heat. Okay, they had higher thermal conductivities. Now in the questions, be really careful about what it's, what it's asking you. Is it asking you for which will transfer the heat the quickest or the slowest? Be really careful, be really mindful of reading that question. Okay, now one way you could improve the experiment would be by using a better thermometer. So maybe a digital thermometer with a higher resolution, you'll be able to get more precise um, numbers. So rather than to the nearest degree, it might be to um, a tenth of a degree or a hundredth of a degree. That would increase the resolution, that would improve your experiment. Or you could uh, put better insulation over the top of the lid. You could use a larger heat source here instead of a smaller one. You could repeat it to find an average and remove anomalous results. All those things would improve it. 
Um, in terms of the variables in this experiment, the independent variable is the type of material. That's the thing we are changing on purpose. The dependent variable is the temperature change. That's the thing we're measuring to see if it's affected by the material, and it is. And the control variables in this experiment would be the thickness of the material, the number of layers of the material, the starting temperature of the water, the volume of the water, the space between the small and the large beaker, all of these different things that we need to keep the same to make the test fair. So only, we're only seeing if the independent variable is having an effect, okay? If we use cold water instead of hot, the graph would look quite similar, but instead of decreasing temperature, it would be rising to room temperature, okay? Um, how do you say safe? This is a relatively safe experiment. The only real big danger, the big hazard, is the hot water in the beaker, okay? That can cause burns. And to stop that from happening, we'd probably, you could say you could use insulated gloves or probably more sensibly, just pour the hot water on a flat leveling surface. Don't like hold the beaker up in the air while you're pouring it. Okay, right, moving on. Next experiment. This one, I think, is the most challenging from paper one. This is the specific heat capacity practical. Now, there are two ways you can go about finding specific heat capacity. In particular, um, finding the energy, how we measure the energy transfer to an, the, the metal block or the material. Okay, one uses this little box with a V and this little box with an A, and then we can use those two measurements to find energy. And the other uses a joule meter. Now the joule meter is a little bit easier, but it's not quite as um, it's not quite as good an experiment. So I want you to do the more challenging one. So in this little um, box here, I'd like you to label the equipment and say what it does, what each piece of equipment is used for, or what each what what, what is the actual bit. Okay. Um, how could you rearrange this equation to find out what specific heat capacity is? Here I've got a little method, you can read it at your leisure. And here I've got a little calculation of how we would use the values from these two instruments to calculate the energy transferred. Okay, so pause the video here and see how you get on. Okay, moving on. Okay, so we've got power supply, this provides potential difference to our um, immersion heater. It's called an immersion heater because it goes inside the block. Okay, um, we've got a thermometer, that's job is to measure the temperature change. We've got a voltmeter to measure the potential difference of the power supply. We've got an ammeter to measure the current in the power supply. The ammeter has to be in series with the heater. The potential difference, when we're measuring potential difference of the voltmeter, that has to be in parallel. So be careful about how we place those in the circuit. Okay, now we use those two things, okay, to calculate that energy transferred to it. Because we know power equals current times by potential difference. And we know that energy is power times time. So we have to also use a stopwatch to record how long the experiment ran for. Okay, so we time those three things together and we can get the energy transferred to the block. And in this case, it's 3,600 joules. Now note, the heater was on for five minutes. I times my five by my 60 because I never work in minutes and I never work in hours. I work in seconds. So be aware, you need to change minutes into seconds. Okay, that has a really good chance of coming up in the paper. Don't miss that mark. Don't lose that mark. Change minutes into seconds. There's a good chance you'll get a mark for doing that, even if you get the rest of the calculation wrong. Okay, so be very aware of that. Okay, moving on. Next practical I want to look at is IV characteristics. Okay, I've got a circuit diagram here. I'd like you to say what each component is and what its job is. I've got Three graphs, two are hidden. One's an ovary conductor, one's a filament bulb, one's a diode. I'd like you to sketch the graphs. And then I want you to try and describe what the graphs are showing. Okay, so tell me why a filament bulb is not an ohmic conductor. Okay, so pause the video here and give it a go. Okay, moving on. So in our circuit, we've got a cell, we've got a variable resistor, we've got an ammeter, we've got whatever test component it is, and we've got a voltmeter. The job of the cell is to provide a potential difference. The job of the ammeter is to measure the current. The job of the voltmeter is to measure the potential difference. And the job of the variable resistor is to control the current flowing through the component. That allows us to change what that voltage would be across that component. Okay, it allows us to plot out a graph. Now something that lots of students in the past have gotten wrong and forgotten is how you can change the direction of the current. Not just change the strength of it, not just change the size, but to change the direction. Okay, by flipping the direction of the cell, by taking it out and putting it back in in the opposite direction, we can get a negative current flowing through the component. Okay, so we just need to change the polarity of the cell to change the direction the current flows in. Be aware of that. So I've got my three graphs. 
I've got my ohmic conductor where potential difference is directly proportional to current. Okay, it's a straight line that goes through zero. Okay, a filament bulb is this kind of S shape. It's not directly proportional because it's not a straight line. Okay, at very, very low currents, however, it does approach being a straight line. So if you've got a really tiny current going through a filament bulb, you might get asked to say that it might model, it might seem like an ohmic conductor. Okay, but especially if you've got a large current where the bulb is getting hot, then certainly the resistance will change and it doesn't behave like an ohmic conductor. Now when you're drawing the filament bulb shaped graph, it looks a bit like an S, but make sure it doesn't tail up and down and go, go quite curly like a real S is. Okay, make sure it looks like this. It doesn't even go completely flat. Okay, the gradient just reduces. Now the last graph we've got is a diode. Here it's um, completely flat here where you've got no current flowing through when we've got a negative potential difference. And then uh, as we have a positive potential difference, we do get current flowing. So the diode only lets current flow in one direction. And then we've got some just results about it. So resistor obeys Ohm's law, it's an ohmic conductor because potential difference is directly proportional to current. The steeper the graph here, the lower the resistance. Okay, so if you think, uh, if I only needed a little bit of potential difference to get a lot of current, it doesn't need as much resistance. Um, a bulb doesn't obey Ohm's law. At high potential difference, the current causes the bulb to heat up, which changes the resistance. Um, diode doesn't obey Ohm's law because it only lets the current flow in one direction. Again, not a straight line. Doesn't uh, Well, this way it does go through zero, but it's not a straight line. Okay. Next little experiment is another electricity one. It's about resistance of a wire. So this time I would like you to sketch the relationship between the resistance of the wire and the length of the wire. What does it look like? And I'd like you to write down some of the other factors that affect the resistance of a wire. I've got a little setup here, a sketch of a circuit where I've got my cell, my ammeter, my voltmeter, my crocodile clips, my thin piece of resistance wire, and I can change the position of my crocodile clips to change the length of the resistance wire. Okay. I'd like you to think about, is this the best setup? Would there be any way I could improve this setup? Okay, it's quite a common question is to improve the setup uh, given to you as an example. What would you do to make the experiment better? Okay, and then we've just got a list of different components and what their factors, what their, what their roles are. Okay, so pause the video here and see what you can do. Okay, moving on. So, um, the graph should be a straight line. Okay, straight line that goes through zero is directly proportional. The longer the length of the wire, the greater the resistance. Okay, the other things that affect the resistance is the temperature of the wire. So the hotter the wire is, the greater the resistance. And the fatter the wire, the greater the diameter, the lower the resistance. Okay, so when we're changing the length, making sure the thickness of the wire is constant is really important. That's relatively easy because wire is a pretty consistent thickness. But the temperature can change especially if the current increases you've got a big current going through a wire it will get hot and that will affect the resistance and it will it will ruin our results okay so we could add a variable resistor into our circuit to help us control the current keep the con keep the current constant which will allow us to keep the temperature constant which will improve our results okay so that's one way we could improve the um setup we've got here Okay, right, moving on. Something else they could ask you is, and I don't think this would be a big long method question, but they might ask you about the resistance um, in series and the resistance in parallel. Okay, so what happens as I add more and more resistors in series? What happens to the current flowing on the circuit? What happens to the total resistance of the circuit? And again, what happens if I keep adding more resistance in resistors in parallel? What happens to the current flowing through this ammeter? What happens to the total resistance of the circuit okay so i'd like you to pause the video here and see what you think what happens to the resistance in series and in parallel okay moving on so in series the total resistance is just all of the individual resistances added up which is equal to the sum of the individual resistors okay and that sort of makes sense because all of the electrons will have to flow into our resistors they go through each one. They can't skip any. Okay, and because of that, because it's just that one path, they all have to go through the same way. The total resistance will just increase as we're adding more resistors. Okay, in parallel, it's a little different. Okay, in parallel, because there's more than one path, 
The electrons will only take one of these paths, but they've got lots to choose from. Choose is a poor word for it, but they've got lots to go through. Okay, so the total resistance, okay, is less, it's less than the sum of the individual resistors. It's less, okay, than the lowest individual resistance. Okay, and that's because they can go through multiple paths. Right, moving on. Another exam question. We've got, make it, we're making ice cream. It's the summer. Okay, we're making ice cream. The diagram below shows a bowl used for making ice cream. The walls of the bowl contain liquid coolant. So we've got this at minus 20. Okay, the bowl is cooled to minus 20 before the mixture is put in the bowl. The bowl causes the mixture to cool down and freeze. We've got inner metal surface and outer plastic surface. We've got the mixture that's going to become ice cream. We've got this liquid coolant. Your job is to answer. Explain why the different thermal conductivities of the metal and plastic are important in the design of the bowl. And we've got this student's answer, and I want you to see how many marks they get. How could you improve it? Pause the video here. Okay. So, this question, it's quite tricky. Okay, and again, this question, like one of the previous ones, metal is a poor insulator. That's, that's true, but that's not answering the question. So you don't get any marks for this at all. Okay, you don't get any marks for saying metal is a poor insulator. You must talk about the thermal conductivity. Okay, so your answer should look something like the metal has a high thermal conductivity. This increases the rate of energy transfer from the ice cream, from the mixture. Okay, because we want heat from the mixture to go into the coolant. And then for the plastic, the plastic has a low thermal conductivity. Okay, this reduces the rate of transfer to the surroundings. We don't want, um, uh, sorry, from the surroundings. We don't want it to, to, to get heat from the surroundings. We want it to heat up. Okay. Um, so when it's talking about this, just really read that question. Use thermal conductivities in your answer. Right, moving on. Um, here, we've got a pressure question. Okay, we've got a canister of air that was tested to find out how the pressure changed when it was used by a diver. Air was allowed to escape from the canister. The pressure of the air in the canister was recorded every five minutes for 80 minutes. And we've got the pressure in megapascals up the y-axis, and we've got time in minutes along the x-axis. Okay, we need to first use figure two, and when it says use figure two, if you don't use the graph here, you can't get the mark. So we've got to figure out how we can get that number from this graph. We need to find the atmospheric pressure, and then it has divers can safely stay underwater until the pressure of the air canister has reduced to 25% of its original volume, uh, original value. Determine the maximum time the diver can safely stay underwater. Use figure two. Again, we have to use figure two to do that. Okay. And then finally, what happens to the volume of air when it's released from the canister? Okay. So here is the student's attempt. I'd like you to spot where any mistakes might be and how you would do the answer better. Okay. Pause the video here. Okay, moving on. Well, the first thing I would say is this blue line. Oh, it's horrible. Okay, it's horrible. Use a ruler. Have a ruler with you in the exam. Okay, use a ruler to draw a straight line. Okay, not a, a, a crooked line like this. A straight line. Okay, perpendicular to the y-axis, parallel to the x-axis. Now, the first one, that's correct. 0 0.1 megapascals. That's where the pressure started to stop changing. Okay, it doesn't get any bigger or any smaller, so the pressure is equalised with atmosphere. Um, but this question, they didn't get the right answer. They have the right method, okay? They've got the right method, but they haven't used their graph effectively enough to get the, um, to, to the right time, okay? Then finally, the volume increases, okay, for the right answer at the end. So to get all the marks, we need a straight line, okay? We need a straight line to find that pressure and get 27 minutes, give or take. Now, I realise that you're working off of a screen, so if you don't get exactly that number, that's fine, just as long as you get the idea of using a ruler on your graph. Okay? Right, moving on. Why did the student only get two marks? Each time the student does one chin-up, he lifts his body up 0.4 metres vertically. The mass of the student is 65 kilograms. The student's able to do 12 chin-ups in 60 seconds. Calculate the power developed by the student. Gravitational field strength is 10 newtons per kilogram. Use the correct equations from the physics equation sheet. Okay, now as soon as I read that, as soon as I read that, I think gravitational field strength. That is a clue for one of the equations I need to use. 
almost certainly I'm going to have to use an equation with gravitational field strength in it. And there's only a few on the equation sheet. Okay, and that makes my energy equals mass times gravitational field strength times height a good choice for my equation. Okay, this is a good choice. And I know it because I'm given that gravitational field strength. Okay, so just be aware of that. Um, but why does the student only get two marks? Pause the video here and see if you can do better. Okay, moving on. So hopefully you spotted that they did not take into account the fact that there were 12 chin-ups in that 60 seconds. Okay, 12 chin-ups. They did the chin-ups 12 times. So their power must reflect that. Okay, I actually think this is quite a harsh question for three marks. I think it should be four. Okay, at least four. Um, but again, don't make that mistake. Use the information in the question. Right, next. Why did the student only get one mark? We've got energy transferred from uh, water in a kettle to the surroundings in two hours. Two hours is 46,200 joules. Calculate the average power output from the water in the kettle to the surroundings in two hours. Use the correct equation from the physics equation sheet. Okay, this is the correct equation. It's not the wrong one. Okay, but I want you to spot their mistake and I want you to get the right one. Pause the video here. Okay, moving on. So... They had to get a good job. They started to change their time. Okay. They started to change their time, but they didn't convert the two hours into seconds. We times two by 60, and then by 60 again to get 7,200 seconds in two hours. Then we rearrange. Okay. So be aware that we don't just move into minutes. We put it into seconds. Right. Next. This is the start of the bits that I think are really hard. Okay. But... You can get loads and loads and loads of marks, even if you don't get the right answer. So we know this is a multi-step calculation question because there's six marks. And if it's six marks, that means almost certainly we have to use two equations and do some other bits and pieces as well. Now this question, I think, is more, one of the more difficult ones. This is tough. This is a difficult question to answer. Okay, But there are hints for how you can figure it out. And, and there are lots of places where you can get marks, even if you can't get the true answer at the end. Okay, notice this, 165 kilojoules, that could get you a mark. Answer to two significant figures, this can get you a mark. Looking at a start temperature and a final temperature, that can help you get marks. So even if you don't get the final answer, give these questions a go. Okay, try, try to get to the end answer. Don't leave it blank and you should be able to get some marks. Okay, so I want you to pause the video here and see if you can work out that calculating, that, that calculation of the mass. Give it a go. Okay, moving on. Now, hopefully you'll have spotted that specific heat capacity is given to you and specific latent heat of fusion is given to you. Now, if you've got these two things, that tells you what two equations you need to use. Okay, the one for specific heat capacity and the one for latent heat of fusion. Okay, um, now energy is used for both. So the total energy will equal both of these added together. Okay, so we need to use the change in energy equals m times c times delta theta, so mass times the specific capacity times the change in temperature, and the energy equals mass times the latent heat, and we can add these things together, we can substitute our values in, we can simplify our equation, and then we can finally rearrange, and we can get a mass of 0.499621. Okay, now this answer won't, will drop you a mark, you need to write it to two significant figures. Okay, but if you use the numbers in here sensibly and you got some answer and you round it to two significant figures, you get that mark. If you haven't done anything but found a change in temperature, you'll also get that mark. Okay, if you convert the very first mark on the page, if you convert from kilojoules to joules, you get a mark. So don't leave these questions blank. Give them a go. Even if they're dead hard, give them a go. Okay, right, next one. We've got the power of a kettle was 2.6 kilowatts. The kettle took 120 seconds to heat 0.8 kilograms of water from 18 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. Calculate the specific capacity of water using this information. Give your answer to two significant figures. Six marks means two equations. 
okay? So, I'd like you to try and figure out what is that specific heat capacity. Pause the video here, give it a go. Okay, moving on. The two equations that we need here is energy equals power times time and energy equals mass times specific capacity times by change in temperature. Okay, and again, we get a mark for changing it into two significant figures. A correct answer given to more than two significant figures will only give you five marks. But putting in, okay, putting in, using the, the numbers in the question will get you a mark. Okay, so give these questions a go. Right, we've got another one. Um, water vapor is gas. Gas has changed state when they cool. Figure eight shows some condensation on a cold bathroom mirror. There's a volume of 2.5 times 10 to the minus 5 meters cubed of condensation forming on the mirror. The density of water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, and the latent heat of vaporization of water is 2.26 times 10 to the 6 joules per kilogram. We need to calculate the energy released when condensation forms. It's a five mark question, means two equations. Now, in this case, sometimes it's helpful, it's not always, but sometimes it's helpful to look at what I need. Okay, I need to calculate energy released. I need to calculate an energy, and I'm given a specific latent heat of vaporization, and I know energy is in that equation. So almost certainly I need to use that equation, but I don't have a mass. Okay, so I'll write down my E equals ML as my first equation, and I think, right, how can I find out what the mass is? And that is what leads me to my second choice of equations. Okay, so sometimes it helps to go backwards from what I need okay and then figure out how i can get all the different quantities for that equation okay and in this case you need the equation for density and the equation for latent heat okay so pause the video here and see if you can calculate that energy okay moving on um so this case the energy is 56,500 joules so first we're substituting into our density equals mass divided by volume we're rearranging for mass we've got a mass and then we substitute in for energy equals the latent heat of fusion times by the mass um, to give us my energy uh, change. Okay? So first we're calculating the mass of the density, then we're using that mass. Okay? Um, now, these questions are difficult. They are challenging, but it's well worth giving them a go. Okay? Right. That is the end of our little masterclass. I wish you all the very best of luck. I'm sure you've worked incredibly hard and you will absolutely smash your physics test. Okay, I wish you the best of possible luck. Well done, boys and girls. Take care. Bye-bye.